So I'm not exactly certain where I got cut off last time, but I'm going to begin at the top of this paragraph about uh, Pyrrho and Sextus Empiricus. A more radical reflection of the era's intellectual shift was the systematic skepticism represented by thinkers such as Pyrrho of Elis and Sextus Empiricus, who held that no truths could be known to be certain and that the only appropriate philo philosophical stance was the complete suspension of judgment. Developing powerful arguments to refute all dogmatic claims to philosophical knowledge, skeptics pointed out that any conflict between two apparent truths could be settled only by appeal to some criterion, yet that criterion could itself be justified only by appeal to some further criterion, which would thereby require an infinite regress of such criteria, non-foundational. Nothing is certain, not even that, said Arcesilas, a member of the Platonic Academy, which significantly also embraced skepticism at this time, renewing a central aspect of its Socratic origins. It is true that in Hellenistic philosophy, logic was often skillfully employed to demonstrate the futility of much of the human enterprise particularly the pursuit of metaphysical truth. Yet, skeptics, such as, such as Sextus Empiricus, argued that people who believed they could know reality were subject to constant frustration and unhappiness in life. If they would genuinely suspend judgment, recognizing that their beliefs about reality were not necessarily valid, then they would achieve peace of mind. Neither affirming nor denying the possibility of knowledge, they should remain in a state of open-minded equanimity, waiting to see what might emerge. While important and attractive in their different ways, these several philosophies did not entirely satisfy the Hellenistic spirit. Divine reality was seen as either in insensitive and irrelevant to human affairs, as in Epicureanism, implacably deterministic, if providential, as in Stoicism, or altogether beyond human cognition, as in skepticism. Since uh, science, too, became more thoroughly rationalistic, shedding the virtually religious impetus and goal of divine comprehension, formerly visible in Pythagoras, Plato, and even Aristotle. Hence the culture's emotional and religious demands were met most directly by the various mystery religions, Greek, Egyptian, and Oriental, which offered salvation from the imprisonment of the world, and which flourished throughout the empire with ever-increasing popularity. But these religions, with their festivals and secret rites devoted to their different deities, failed to compel the allegiance of many in the educated classes. For them, the old myths were dying, good at best as allegorical instruments for reasonable discourse. And yet the austere rationalism of the dominant philosophies left a certain spiritual hunger. That uniquely creative unity of intellect and feeling of earlier times had now bifurcated in the midst of an extraordinarily sophisticated cultural milieu, busy, urbanized, refined, cosmopolitan. The reflective individual was often without compelling motivation. The classical synthesis of pre-Alexandrian Greece had come apart, its potency spent in the process of diffusion. Yet, the Hellenistic era was an exceptionally rich age with several remarkable and, from the perspective of the modern West, indispensable cultural accomplishments to its credit. Not least was its recognition of the earlier Greek achievement and its consequent preservation of the classics, from Homer to Aristotle. The texts were now collected, systematically examined, and painstakingly edited to prepare a definitive canon of masterworks. Humanistic scholarship was founded. New disciplines of textual 
and literary criticism were developed, interpretive analyses and commentaries produced, and the great works set forth as revered cultural idols for the enrichment of future generations. In Alexandria, the Greek, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, uh, the Septuagint, was similarly compiled, edited, and canonized with the same meticulous scholarship as that accorded to the Homeric epics and Platonic dialogues. Education itself became systematized and widespread. Large and elaborately organized academic institutions were established for the pursuit of scholarly research in the nature cities, Alexandria with its museum, Pergamum with its library, and Athens with its still thriving philosophical academies. The royal rulers of the major Hellenistic empire states subsidized the public institutions of learning, employing scientists and scholars as salaried officials of the state. Public educational systems existed in almost every Hellenistic city. Gymnasia and theaters were plentiful, and advanced instruction in Greek philosophy, literature, and rhetoric became widely available. The Greek Pideia flourished. Thus, the earlier Hell Hellenic achievement was scholastically consolidated, geographically extended, and vitally sustained for the remainder of the classical era. On to the next section of this chapter, or this uh, the next part of this section of chapter two, uh, across currents of the Hellenic matrix, titled "Strong." As for original contributions, it was in the field of natural science that the Hellenistic period especially excelled. The geometer. Euclid, the geometer astronomer Apollonius, the mathematical physicist Archimedes, the astronomer Hipparchus, the geographer Strabo, the physician Galen, and the geographer astronomer Ptolemy all produced scientific advances and codifications that would remain paradigmatic for many centuries. The development of mathematical astronomy was particularly consequential. The problem of the planets had found its first solution in Eudoxus's interconnected homocentric spheres, which both explained retrograde motion and gave approximately accurate predictions. It did not, however, explain the variations of brightness when the planets were retrograde, since the rotating spheres necessarily kept the planets at constant distance from the Earth. It was this theoretical failing that provoked subsequent mathematicians and astronomers to explore alternative geometrical systems. A few, such as the Pythagoreans, made the radical suggestion that the Earth moved. Heraclides, a member of Plato's Academy, proposed that the diurnal movement of the heavens was actually caused by the Earth rotating on its axis, and that Mercury and Venus, which always appeared close to the Sun, did so because they revolved about the Sun rather than the Earth. A century later, Aristarchus went so far as to hypothesize that the Earth and all the planets revolved around the Sun, and that the Sun, like the outer sphere of stars, remained stationary. These various models were generally rejected, however, for sound mathematical and physical reasons. No annual stellar parallax was ever observed, and such a shift should have occurred if the Earth revolved around the Sun, and thus traveled such vast distances relative to the stars. Unless, as Aristarchus suggested, the outer sphere of stars is inconceivably large. Moreover, a moving Earth would entirely disrupt the comprehensive coherence of Aristotelian cosmology. Aristotle had definitively treated the physics of fallen bodies, demonstrating that heavy objects move toward the Earth because it is the universe's fixed center. If the Earth moved, then this well-reasoned and virtually self-evident account of fallen bodies 
would be undermined with no theory of comparable power to replace it. Perhaps even more fundamentally, a planetary Earth would contravene the ancient and also self-evident terrestrial celestial dichotomy based on the transcendent majesty of the heavens. Finally, theoretical and religious issues aside, common sense dictated that a moving Earth would force objects and persons on it to be knocked about. Clouds and birds would be left behind, and so forth. The unambiguous evidence of the senses argued for a stable Earth. On the basis of such considerations, the majority of Hellenistic astronomers decided in favor of an Earth-centered universe, and continued working with various geometrical models for explaining the planetary positions. The cumulative results of these efforts was codified in the 2nd century AD by Ptolemy, whose synthesis established the working paradigm for astronomers from that time through to the Renaissance. The essential challenge presented to Ptolemy remained as before. How to account for the numerous discrepancies between, on the one hand, the basic structure of the Aristotelian, Aristotelian cosmology, which demanded that the planets move uniformly in perfect circles around the central and mobile Earth, and, on the other hand, astronomers' actual observations of the planets, which appeared to move with varying speeds, directions, and degrees of brightness. Building on the recent advances of Greek geometry, the Babylonians continued observations and linear computational techniques, and on the work of the Greek astronomers, Apollonius and Hipparchus, Ptolemy outlined the following scheme. The outermost revolving sphere of the fixed stars daily carried the entire heavens westward about the Earth. Within that sphere, however, each planet, including the sun and moon, revolved eastward at varying slower rates, each in its own large circle, called a deferent. For the more complex movements of the planets other than the sun and moon, another smaller circle, called an epicycle, was introduced, which rotated uniformly around a point that, continue, that continued to rotate on the deferent. The epicycle solved what, ex what Eudox's spheres could not, since the rotating epicycle automatically brought the planet closer to the Earth whenever it was retrograde and thus made the planet appear brighter. By adjusting the different rates of revolution for each deferent and epicycle, astronomers could approximate the variable movements of each planet. The simplicity of the deferent epicycle scheme, plus its explanation of variable brightness, made it the acknowledged victor in the quest for a viable astronomical model. Yet when applied, this scheme revealed further minor irregularities to explain which, Ptolemy employed further geometrical devices. Eccentrics, which are circles whose centers were displaced from the center of the Earth. Minor epicycles, which were additional smaller circles that rotated about a major epicycle or deferent. And equants, which further explained variable speeds by positing another point away from the circle's center, about which motion was uniform. Ptolemy's elaborate model of compound circles was able to give the first systematic, quantitative account of all the celestial motions. Moreover, its versatility, whereby new conflicting observations could be met by adding new geometrical modifications, e.g. adding another epicycle to an epicycle, or an, ex or an eccentric to an eccentric, gave the model a flexible power that sustained its reign through the classical and medieval periods. The Aristotelian cosmology, with its fixed central Earth, its circling, etheric spheres, and its elemental physics, had provided the basic framework for the Hellenistic astronomers to forge this scheme, and the synthesized Ptolemaic Aristotelian universe in turn became the fundamental world conception informing the West's philosophical, religious, and scientific vision for most of the subsequent 15 centuries.